everyone. I'm so excited to see you because you know what we're going to do tonight, don't you? It's a poison kind of evening. Poison and cocktails and Deborah Blum, who's going to show us the way. Now, we're not actually going to poison anybody, though I did have someone ask. Um, trust me, we're not going to explain to you how to bump anyone off. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about how people get caught instead. So, before we get any further along, I just want to bring on the amazing, the illustrious, the poisonous Deborah Blum. <laughs> That's the best introduction I've ever had. Hey, yeah. everybody. Yes. I We are seeing so many wonderful comments already. Charming Disaster is here tonight because the song that we choose as our opener is actually based partly on Deborah Blum's book blue bottles in her uh, instructions about the bottles with the ridges so that you shouldn't poison yourself should you grab the wrong one. Oh, people are liking the hat. Thank you. This is the more masculine version of myself. Um, I, I actually wore the tie pin and everything today. So I'm really excited because um, this harkens back to my years in the museum. Tonight's drink is a bee's knees cocktail. And I know, Deborah, that uh, you have a little bit of background on this. This was one of the cocktails that they, in fact, served during Prohibition. Is that not right? That's exactly right. And during Prohibition, there were a lot of very creative cocktails to mask the taste of bathtub gin right. and uh, industrial alcohol that was being circulated by different uh, uh, bootleggers, and so you got this wonderful array of highly flavored cocktails, and one of them it's, was. It's amazing. really, really fun. Um, I think I think you have to you have to sort of appreciate um, that you know prohibition really did change the way we do things. We didn't have these kinds of exciting cocktails, and uh, Mike Mike Breen is saying uh, you know it really did change his 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 opinion. Like that things were quite different than um, we expected. So, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> using this old wildflower honey in tonight's drink. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Um, but uh, we're very excited to have you on, partly too, because I love the combination in this book, because we've got jazz, and we have prohibition, and we have poison, and we have murder, and we have drinks. And I don't know, that's basically our show. This is kind of what we do. <laughs> um, and Wait a minute. There we are. Sorry, Davy, I lost us for a second. Davy's Davy's very good at the background, and I'm not. I was just I was just popping up the book so everyone could see it. That's all. <laughs> Hello, Davy. You guys can still get signed copies, by the way. Um, and part of this is coming through through Deb's bookstore, but also those of you in the UK can get it at Fox Lane. So uh, Belmont Books and Fox Lane Books are the two places to get signed copies of Deb's book. We are so excited because um, I actually I, I have I have one myself just for my own little self. Um, I know some of you actually did some pretty crazy things tonight. Um, we have some people um, using orange bitters and some bourbon barrel aged gin, which I thought was very cool. And uh, someone else had made their own, I I'm not, I, I think I lost the comment. Um, someone else had made their own lavender bitters for tonight. Mm. And I had originally told people to use rose water in the cocktail, then accidentally switched it to orange flower water. So we might be trying all sorts of new things tonight. But I love the idea that um, that the flavors were masking something bad. Would the flavors keep you from dying? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like enjoy the experience before you died. <laughs> right. Well, that's that's true. Lavender bitters. That was Susan Ballinger. That's right. Um, and mm. it, it's it's just fascinating forensics teacher so we've got some <laughs> one of the as charming disasters saying one of the things they found fascinating in the book was the point that the government deliberately introduced poison into the alcohol i was shocked by that i really was yeah me too and uh, that was one of the things where i was looking i, I mean all of the searches where i was doing about more about poison. And when I started doing searches in newspapers like the New York Times about poison and prohibition, I'm like, what's this government poisoning of alcohol? I never heard of that. And I was so doubted myself as a researcher, and I'm a fairly anal researcher, but I was like, this can't be right because I've never heard this. So I did a much more detailed search. I went to the Chicago Tribune and I went to other newspapers. And then I started going through 
magazines of the time. And I finally realized there was this huge thing that everyone knew in the 1920s. You actually had, I think it was the Chicago Tribune wrote a piece saying the 18th Amendment is the only amendment that carries the death penalty with it. And the Indianapolis yeah. paper, I think it was that, mm -hmm. called um, the government, the Borgia government, because so oh. many people were being poisoned. And so I, before I wrote anything about that, I mm -hmm. felt it was really important for me to get all those ducks in a row, because that was the one thing that I thought nobody remembers this <laughs> and we've forgotten it and it's so important and it's such a good lesson about the dangers of a moral crusade, I think, oh, right? Yeah. You mm -hmm. had all these dry prohibitionists thinking they could improve human behavior by just driving yeah. people out. Yeah. And that did not work, but they were willing to kill people to try to make it happen. Good. I don't know. There's echoes that I might be hearing in today's world. I don't know. You know. Um, but I, I, it's, yeah, the charming disaster just backed it up by saying uh, it's the opposite of harm reduction. It's literally yes. adding harm to the mix, which I think is kind of um, it, it, extremely upsetting. We we talked a little bit about it uh, with our with our skit team, uh, finger guns and lady paws. So I th I thought we would we would just do a quick quick peek at what they discovered and then bring back while we're showing the skit. You guys go ahead and queue up your questions. Davy and I are going to be curating them and throwing them into the feed as soon as we come back. But first, finger guns and lady paws bringing you prohibition. Hello, peculiars. I'm finger guns. And I'm Lady Paws. Today, we want to talk to you about the amazing Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Blum. It talks a lot about the Prohibition era. Prohibition? Isn't that when nobody could have any fun? Yes, actually. Uh, alcohol had been prohibited, which is where it got its name. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about this is that you have the rise of forensics and a study of, of poisons and how to detect them. At the same time, you have people not allowed to have the uh, their usual poisons of choice, and instead, they had to make their own. Mm. So one of the troubles of uh, trying to distill alcohol from something that you shouldn't be consuming in the first place, it is a complicated process, and it's essentially science. It's sort of like a scientific experiment, mm. and it involves... And of course, if you distill it properly, what you get is a pretty reasonable alcohol. But you're in luck. I, with my handy blowtorch and a reasonable scientific mind, and you two have figured out how to distill my own. Yes, we have turned something into the elixir of life. Was YouTube around back then? We're gonna give this a go and find out. Is this the kind of swill that will poison your friends? Or is it alcohol that I've distilled? Let's let's find out. It's alcohol, and I won't die! Ha ha! What do you think, Lady Paws? That's Agent Paws to you, see? You're under arrest for making illegal alcohol. Oh no! It's the fuzz! Where did she go? Well, might as well not waste it. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> I love that. A, a brief take, a brief take from Finger Guns and Lady Paws, um, and I, that's a, it's a good way also of queuing up the the conversation. We've got lots of questions that have come in while that was playing along, and I see one from Catherine. Uh, this isn't necessarily a question, but it is a really interesting comment about the book. She says, "I enjoyed that Charles Norris simply bought lab supplies out of his own pocket when Tammany Hall cut his funding. I think that's great." Yes, I loved that about him because he was so dedicated and he spent all kinds, bought all kinds of things out of his personal fortune to, to make sure they did things right. One of my favorite moments in him buying supplies was when he was actually he was often fighting with the mayor of New York, but he was in a deep fight with one of the mayors who got so mad at him that he actually sent people to the uh, forensic uh, the chief medical examiner's office to take things away, including the clocks. Oh, so, and you actually need a clock when you're doing scientific experiments, right? How long does this particular formula need to? And so Charles Norris had to go out and buy new clocks for the office. And, and he was very publicly vocal about 
that. And I like that about him too. I mean, he didn't mess around when people did him wrong. I love that. Uh, Lorelai Peterson just mo uh, mentions that she was interviewing for a current job. They asked me what the most recent book I had read was. And I was in my head saying, shut up as I went on and on about how <laughs> Like, you know, just, just poisons. Yes. And the Poisoner's Handbook. I had so many friends when the book first came out or people who would write me and say, I was so embarrassed when I was sitting on an airplane reading your book and everyone started looking at me like I was a potential poisoner. And one of my friends who was working for Time Magazine at the time was uh, read it to review it. And she, I think it was, she was reviewing, but anyway, she said she put a brown paper cover over it on the subway because she got really tired of people looking at her like she was an assassin. <laughs> Well, Jen B says, it's not a question, but I adore you, Ms. Mom, and I think most of us do. Well, that's mutual, Jen. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, let's see here. I see a few more questions popping up. You guys keep writing them. It takes just a minute for them to queue up for us. Um, whoops, I've lost track. Davey, I hope you you're, can see these too. I love my kitchen timer. Yes. Um, you know, I, I do have a kitchen timer. I have two. And I find that the digital timers just aren't the same as the ones that you can wind up and, and actually like, let like click away and, and ring for you. I don't know if that's true of other of you other scientifically minded folk. Agatha said, this is my all time favorite book. I give it to everyone as a gift. I like that. I it do is too, actually. Right. Test, though, I wonder what that says, like here, because it, it says handbook. Right. Here, and honey. You know, it's not actually a guide to killing people as much as it's a partly a guide to how to get caught. But it's true. But it's also, you know, a lot of my friends who uh, you know, will talk to me about all the writers, the important writers, the serious writers that they were inspired by. And I always say to them, Well, I was inspired by Agatha Christie when mm -hmm. I wrote this book, right? <laughs> I wanted it to have some of it that kind of here's a mystery can you figure it out field yes. and some of the suspense and and those are two of the things i really like about the way that book sort of unwinds itself so Plus it's cool chemistry. Word, you know and we and you do it and you just make it this wonderful uh you spin it forward with such verve you know um i i just find myself getting really excited as i read it even though i've read it before uh anna asks how did you come up with the title oh that's a great question so um when I sold this book, and, and I have a, a ridiculous story about selling this book, actually. Um, well, so I'll tell you that, and then I'll tell you the title. So I had just finished writing a, a book uh, about, it's called Ghost Hunters, about this 19th century hunt to prove life after death. And I had been nagging my agent for years to let me write a book in which poisons were characters. That was really my basic idea. I want to write a book in which poisons are the characters. And after I finished Ghost Hunter, she said to me, okay, to make you shut up, why don't you go ahead and do that poison bottle book you've always been talking about, right? And I'm like, great. And she said, and then she goes, but don't write a proposal because you, you just write a, a letter to your option editor, make it a couple of pages and make it delicious. And <laughs> so normally when I had been selling a book, I, you know, I'd write an actual proposal and a chapter outline. And here's what I think I'm doing. And I was so intrigued by that idea. I thought, could I sell a book based on a two page love letter to my editor? Right. And so just as a writer, I was really intrigued by that idea. So I came up with this idea. I went and I got a bunch of books about poison. And then I wrote my editor this letter about how um, I could actually poison my husband and not get caught. But I wasn't planning to do that. And I went through some of the cool stuff about poison that would enable me to, you know, poison my husband and then explained that I wasn't going to. And she bought the book based on that, right? Oh, my gosh. And it's so, something. yeah, it's such a crazy story in the book writing world. And so she buys the book and I'm like, cool. And I got the advance and I immediately spent it. I don't want to think about this. And then after I spent the advance, so I couldn't give it back. I thought, <laughs> what in the world is this book actually about? Right. Because it can't be a, a book about me trying to kill my husband. Um, <laughs> even though I will say yeah. for some time afterwards, he would not let me pour me a cup of coffee him a cup of coffee. But so I went on this desperate search to try to figure out how to tell my book about poisons and characters 
And I had, I was like, well, what is this narrative spine of this book? Mm -hmm. And finally, and I think I actually would not have found Gettler and Norris if I hadn't been so desperate. Um, but finally, I went into the um, newsletters of the Society of Forensic Toxicology, and there was a throwaway line in one of the newsletters about Alexander Gettler, the father of forensic toxicology. And I thought, okay, this is great. Here's my guy. And then I'll just get a biography of him, but there was none, right? <laughs> so then I started this search to try to just build a portrait of Alexander Gettler. And as I got deeper into this, I realized that he had this amazing partnership with a very different scientist, Charles Norris, and that their story was in fact the story of the invention of forensic toxicology. And off I went, right? Yeah. Um, still with poisons as characters, but having these two really dedicated, underpaid, amazing scientists sort of build the science. And that book, when I sold it on the idea of poisoning my husband, my agent had put a title on it called The Poison Chronicles. <laughs> yes, no more cocoa. That's exactly right. And, uh, and with thallium in it, even. And <laughs> so um, I, and after the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, I really don't like that title. And so I started thinking about the fact that it really was a handbook about poisoners. And originally I was going to call it, um, uh, a handbook for poisoners. Okay. And I was talking to one of my friends about it and he said, that's too long. Call it the poisoner's <laughs> handbook. Everyone's a critic, right? But he was right. And so when I went back to my editor and I said, I want to call this the poisoner's handbook, she was like, go. And it works so well. I mean, it really does. Because it's such a, um, I, I have several people saying like carrying the book on the train is a good way to get have people leave you alone. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's true. I think... It, it it teases you a little bit, and I, I I do want I mean I'm I want to get back to the questions of the group, but I do want to ask you at some point through the course of our of our um, our chat, being someone who writes science but then making it narrative and making it pull you in in that way. I mean this is this is this is the stuff dreams are made of. This is exactly the kind of book that we really like here at Peculiar Book Club because it's not it's not academic and yet it has all this rich research, which I think is is so exciting. You know, one of the things that about this is I really am a geeky science writer. And so in the book, you'll you see that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> no, you're right. It's totally one of my most outstanding qualities. And, and there is a kind of underlying message mm -hmm. in that book that chemistry is cool because I think chemistry is cool. And I think poisons are really cool yeah. in the way they trick the body, in the way, mm -hmm. you know, poisoners use them to trick use poison. I mean, the actual human murderers also right. treat people. I mean, it's just this wonderful complex, but I like the idea of being able to take some of that cool science out to a, a wider audience. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that actually has made me really happy about this book is it's taught now in a lot of high school kids. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <gasps> that was the cocktail. <laughs> I'm done. Um, <laughs> but it's taught in a lot of high school chemistry mm -hmm. classes as a way for people to see that this is really cool stuff. Yeah. And I've done a lot of Zoom talks with high school classes and actually gave a talk with oh, like the me. National Association of High School Chemistry Teachers, right? And they were super cool. And chemistry is really cool. It's beautiful, fundamental, sinister. It's like the best of all science. I, I have to agree with you. I And I just, I tend to like the, you know, the periodic table is always... I, I think if I was going to have like some giant full body tattoo, like the whole periodic table, that would be awesome. But then, you know, that's a lot. So um, Mike Breen asks, so the various poisons you've written about, which one scares you the most? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Well, yeah. I mean, arsenic is generally my favorite poison because it's so multi-talented, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it can kill you at a high at a high dose acute level it can kill you more slowly at a very tiny level right it, mm -hmm. it's risky at less than a part per million um mm -hmm. which is sort of insane um i think the poisons that scare me the most are the ones that are uh, hard, hardest to find mm -hmm. and uh, most accessible today, right? Arsenic yeah. is really hard to get today. Thallium, which is another poison in my book, was is really hard to get today. 
uh, cyanide is a much more accessible poison because it's so common in nature. Yeah, true. Right. And so I find that a fairly scary poison. It's a fast acting, mm -hmm. um, fairly accessible poison. This is not me saying go out and figure out how to brew up your own cyanide. But uh, I actually was looking at a story because there's a lot of glycocyanides in, in different plants. And there's elderberry, right, is one mm -hmm. of these. Mm -hmm. recipes. And people have given themselves cyanide poisoning from elderberry. Yeah. Right. So I'm really aware. Uh, I'm afraid of the poisons, I think, that are, are sort of easy, easily to get out of nature and that we can make mistakes with. Yeah. So cyanide is an example mm -hmm. of a really scary poison because it, it not only is a homicidal poison, but it's not uh, that hard to accidentally poison yourself. Right. Oh, yeah. There was a, a teacher, actually, who she didn't realize the cooking versus raw problem. And so she'd heard that elder berries were good for you and good for a cold. And she basically gave herself cyanide poisoning as a result, um, which is terrifying. And it That's is, right. I, I have a big, I have an apothecary garden in the back. So I know a lot about poisonous things, but. It, and here's elderberry flowers and pancakes, yeah. right? I think people just really don't realize you know, I'm always saying to people, quit saying that because it's natural, it's safe. Nature's yeah. really dangerous, right? Nature's really dangerous. You and whoops, uh, sorry there, Davey. I kicked you off there. Oh yeah. So it was about nature does not come in a blue <laughs> bottle. <laughs> does not warn you. Tylenol is the scary. organization. The point about the organization of the book that to me was the hardest thing for me. And there was a point once I was thinking about how I wanted to tell that story. And I knew I wanted to tell it poison by poison with every chapter being about a poison and the poison being the character in that chapter. And right. But I also wanted to move forward to this sort of pioneering work by Gettler and Norris in which they're building forensic toxicology. I mean, it's still so amazing to me that Alexander Geller was the first person in the world to figure out how to tell if someone was a drunk driver, right? I mean, just, I mean we, we take it for granted, you know? And so it's just incredible work. But moving them forward year by year and then figuring out what poison went where and when I was going to drop back to talk about the poison and what case I wanted to use to explain a poison, that was really hard. The structure of the book, that's the most difficult structure I've ever done because it was so complicated. And at one point, uh, so, several chapters in, I thought to myself, what have I done? I do not have the talent to pull this book off. Having said that, um, that's not like a false modesty thing. I feel like that uh, with every book I write. I, there's always a certain point in writing the book that I think, why did I say yes to that? I'm never going to be able to pull this off. And I always have this image when I send the first draft of the manuscript off to my editor and I don't hear from her immediately <laughs> that because she's committed suicide on receipt, right? She read the manuscript and then she hung her, not poisoned herself. Not in really. my story, she hung herself in a closet and they're going to discover her body later. So you, ha you actually can't, I think, be a writer without being a little neurotic. It's right. That's, that's true. It's a secret. Yeah. We're not supposed to tell people that. Deborah. Sorry, I'm giving away all the <laughs> trade craft. Jennifer secrets. Pierce says her favorite quoted New York Times headline was um, "Aged couple stra slain strangely." <laughs> <laughs> Perfect for the Peculiar Book Club. Isn't that wonderful? And and going back into those old newspaper stories and, and just seeing the way they presented some of these cases was so interesting to me and the way they would also i mean we still do this today but they would give nicknames to some of the right. killers right, right. early right. on really and bad nicknames and don't that's <laughs> right so, you know this in person this, women were almost always borgias right yeah, of course um, yeah. and yeah. the yeah. one of the most evil people in my book was marianne creighton who yeah. comes back is in two different arsenic stories <laughs> and, and, and in the coverage of her, of her she was forever a borgia right yeah because well it, it's not there it's, it's in many ways it's not terribly you know creative but it is highly accurate in some ways and i think um charming disasters that they were actually fascinated by the detail about the cherry red blood being a tell for carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide. i had no idea i i now feel i mean the sad part about this is i read your book and i'm like yeah, show me a murder. I'll know how it happened. And I wouldn't, right? But it does give me a little bit of 
a sense that I, I actually know how things m might might go. Um, wonderful. And there's a case, like one of the first cases in there is this murder of Leah Freinlich in which Geller looks at the corpse, which is pale, and says that can't be an illuminated gas death because the corpse is pale, right? One of the most interesting things about that, that's very a very toxicology specialist kind of take, right? right? And I have gone and talked to chemistry departments and I'll say, and then he looks at the corpse and he says, that can't be eliminating gas because, or carbon monoxide because the corpse is pale. Why do you think that is? And, and chemistry, these entire rooms full of chemists will go, I have no idea, right? And so, I mean, I love that for mm -hmm. the specificity of it, but it's so, I also, for some reason, am weirdly fascinated by the idea that uh, people who die of carbon monoxide poisoning look healthy. Right, they're yeah. all yeah. like pink cheeked and healthy looking, which is really weird. Or like they made have rosacea. Um, yeah. Jen B says she's actually made a little travel guide, so she goes to see the locations from the book, which is a great way to connect. I think that's true. Um, Britain also saying title's brilliant. Why she picked up the book in the first place? That's great and to hear. For the comments. Um, let's see. Lots of chemistry teachers, uh, or lots of chemistry is cool comments, and and at least one. A chemistry teacher and um, Britain saying Yay. geeks rule the, world. the world. Totally true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've I've fallen behind on my question. Sorry, the, everything is so interesting, but I just keep I keep listening instead of paying attention here. Um, let's see uh, the mic. Yes, the Mike Mallory, uh, that it, it is. And she says it's her favorites and then she follows it up. And by favorites, I mean terrifyingly interesting. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you say that because I absolutely love the story of Mike Malloy or durable Mike Malloy, right? Durable. durable. <laughs> yes. And it's such like a great story on so many levels. I mean, it's a story of prohibition and... Uh, and the Great Depression and how desperate people were, right? right? And it's like centered on this little speakeasy in the Bronx and, and, and these people who are barely scraping by and they come up with they, what they think is this brilliant murder plot in which they ensure the life of this alcoholic drifter and he turns out to be the worst possible victim. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, the things that guy survived, including being run over by a cab, by a cab. Like, right, are just insane. And he actually, I mean, I write a lot in the book about the poisonous nature of methanol. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he isn't phased by that either, right? He really was indestructible. Right. And so happy about it. Like, not, not, he wasn't like indestructible in a superhero kind of way. He was an indestructible in a I need a doctor kind of way. Yes. He did have to go to the hospital after the cab ran over him. Right. <laughs> um, and he wasn't so indestructible. And, 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 you know, this is eventually ends up being one of my carbon monoxide points. I actually like, speaking of poisons, I do like, I like poisons to be efficient. I mean, if I'm going to mess around with a poison, I want it to work. Well, Carbon monoxide is such an efficient poison, mm -hmm. right? And it's still really dangerous. We still have you know, tens of thousands of people in the United States who suffer from carbon monoxide poisoning and a number of people who die. Because one of the things, as I go off on my PSA about carbon monoxide, is that we can't smell it. It's a it's an odorless gas. And so there's carbon monoxide. I have a gas stove. And if it, the pilot light doesn't click right away, you know, you'll get this kind of bitter smell, but that's not the carbon monoxide. That's chloropicrin, which is what we add to sort of give you a warning scent. Yeah. But if you have carbon monoxide from a gas grill or from a running car, right, you actually cannot smell it. And so People really need to be aware of how dangerous um, it it is. And yes, um, the story Absolutely. about the guy, I love the story. Because, sorry, as I skip away from my PSA, be really <laughs> careful with carbon monoxide, it's still dangerous. Um, one of my other favorite stories in the book is about um, a man who thought he had murdered a woman and so dismembered her right. and tried to throw yeah. away the body. It's not right? well, you know, I mean, it's not, not go well for him. And, efficient guy at all. And it's such a interesting case because, you know, I was talking earlier about um, uh, Leah Freinlich, who was the woman who was 
uh, not killed by carbon monoxide, but suffocated by her husband. And he tried to fake a carbon monoxide death. Right. And then after that, Gettler, speaking of geeks ruling the world, goes out and does all these experiments to show that you can't absorb carbon monoxide after death. Right. It, even though she was in a room filled with carbon monoxide, that wouldn't have affected the end results. And so in this other case, yes, I love that too. The bullet made from the silver. Yeah, from, well, speaking of the undead, right? The Gettler. Yes. <laughs> and, and the guy, this was a, sorry, just doing a side trip, was a guy in the circus who was using silver to create a kind of blue skin for himself and ended up giving himself silver poisoning. Oops. Right. Don't do that. Right? Not the right kind of blue man group to be to be involved. That's in exactly that. right. That's but in this other really case, when they they eventually figure out, I mean, mm -hmm. my favorite, it's sort of gruesome, but when they find the dismembered body, the dismembered body is is cherry red. Right. And it shouldn't be because there's this massive blood loss from dismemberment. It should have been, you know, marble white. And so you get to watch them as they work their way through figuring out what happened and actually save the life of this idiot who cut the body up. Oh, what right? a, yeah. What a goof. What a doofus. Like, what the yeah. What a really like, okay, I've got this body. I may have killed her. So the right thing to do is to right chop her into pieces. Yeah. Right. It's slightly inebriated still. Kristen says it's interesting that all this work ended up. Uh, done in the practical setting versus the academic, and 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 to be honest, stays in the practical. I know nowadays our academic and practical in terms of forensics are kind of overlapping, but um, but it is a really interesting fact that we've we've ended up in that sort of um, a crystallized, tangible, workmanlike uh, way of learning about poisons as opposed to kind of theoretical. Yes, I mean I think that's true. Maybe now we see a little bit more academic mm -hmm. work, but back in the time. Um, you know, and and this goes to one of the points I want to make in the book. Uh, forensic toxicology was not an existing science at all when Norris and Gettler came in. There were chemists who practiced what they called legal medicine, who studied the bad effects of poisons, um, but there wasn't an actual academic profession. There were no university classes in any of this, right? So all of this really important analytical chemistry had to be done in laboratories like the Goris, Norris and Gettler lab. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Norris and Gettler helped start one of the first forensic medicine, you know, courses at NYU. Mm -hmm. um, but but it was not a, considered an actual profession. It was looked down on by real chemists, right? right. Real right. chemists were doing academic work and these, yeah. you know, civil servants in their city laboratories were doing this analytical chemistry. And it took a while, mm -hmm. right? It took a while for the police to actually realize that this was useful because it had had such a uh, you know, the the world of appointed coroners had been so shoddy and untrustworthy. And it took a while for this kind of forensic analytical chemistry to become accepted in academic circles, right? Yeah. And it was driven by people like Norris and Gettler, mm -hmm. um, Oscar Edward Heinrich in uh, California did some of this work. Um, mm -hmm. There's a guy up here in Boston named William Boo. There was a guy named John Marshall down at... Um, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. I, I mean, I write the book and I kind of acknowledge this in the book, really focused on what Norris and Gettler did, but it's important to realize there were other scientists really trying to make this. They, they made it They made it cool though. I mean, and some of it is that you have to have that figurehead, you have to have that personality. And I think you're, you're it, there's all, it's a weird love story almost between Norris and Gettler in the sense that they're this, this dynamic duo that without them, you know, it, and, and it's still actually quite, uh, opaque to many people in the public. I was looking at Autumn. She says when she worked in autopsy, one of the most common questions was, did you test for poison? And it was heartbreaking to have to explain every time that it doesn't, it's not quite how it works. Um, it's still quite opaque to the public. I, there's still so much that in general, people just don't know about it. And I think your book goes a long way to kind of re-educating people. Um, and of course, nature is itself, um, quite dangerous, you know, yes. talking about poisons that are coming from plants. And, and actually, we have a little bit of a song for you. So we have a traveling peculiar, because you yeah. were all stuck, we're all stuck inside, none of us can go anywhere. Um, but we do have a traveling peculiar, his name is Cord Ravenswood, we introduced him in our last show. And, um, and Cord uh, has a little song for you about some things that happen in nature and how they might be used against someone who might annoy their 
partner. I love that idea. Yeah. Oh, hello there, Peculiars. It's me, your Peculiar in the Field, Cord Ravenswood. And I'm just having a little snack right now. My wife prepared this for me. She... <laughs> that can't be a good sign. It's true, she's been a little unhappy with me lately, but... Hmm. This reminds me of a song about... Chrysanthemum salad. Some days you're feeling down, 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 down. You just need a little pick me up, up, up. Well, I've been known to guzzle in the thrill that comes from a sip from a dangerous cup. Oh, you gotta pick your poison, baby. Is all yours. Yes, and sometimes I think maybe the poison kills the dying more. One day my friend told me something I could trust. Every flower my wife plants is poisonous. I criticized her cooking far too freely. Now the insurance policy has become recently increased. Oh. You know what that means. And that salad I ate the other night tasted like more than mere mixed greens. My arms are starting to feel leaden. Oh. And my eyesight's beginning to blur. My mouth kind of tastes like a bouquet at a baby shower. But I'll be honest with you, none of this is boring. Oh, you gotta pick your poison, baby. Yeah, but the preference is all yours. And sometimes I think maybe the poison kills the dying more. Kills the dying more. The poison kills the dying more. The poison kills the dying more. Um, honey, about that insurance policy. Well, okay, peculiars, that's all for now. Again, it's been me, Cord Ravenswood, your peculiar in the field, roving far and then farther. See you next time. <laughs> so that's great. Cord. Cord. Yeah, he has, um, you know, he may have upset his, his significant there a little bit. I have seen a bunch of really interesting chatter over here about uh, carbon, about CO and also um, spook and uh, making people hallucinate. Um, were there ghosts in the lab? That was a question. Alexandria said, Alexandra said, I would totally haunt people if I was poisoned, which <laughs> fair, fair. Um, Susan Ballinger was saying the whole time she was listening to the book, she kept picturing a scene in that old Madame Bovary movie where she's eating fistfuls of arsenic. I did too. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> oh, wrong, bad, bad stuff. Um, and Catherine says she was struck by the, the <laughs> who listened to the cause of death as like assault or diabetes because. Wasn't that but, hilarious? Right. They're so close together. You know? And that really goes back to before the EMA when we had politically appointed coroners. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the list of people who were politically appointed coroners in New York before Charles Norris, they were milkmen and sign painters and funeral home operators. And they didn't actually often even go out to look at the body. And they were so underpaid that they would sell the cause of death. There's a great example of someone, well, I don't know if it's a happy example, but uh, right. the city of New York talked about someone who had committed suicide. He'd put a gun right here and blown out, it had blown out the top of his head and his family okay. didn't want it to be a suicide. So they bought a cause of death, which was ruptured aneurysm, right? Oh. And, and this was one of the reasons the police didn't want to work with these so-called forensic scientists, right? 
And so one of the things that Norris and Geller had to do was really rebuild that relationship and prove to them that this matter. I, I wanted to go back. Sorry, my dog is uh, wants to be part of the conversation. Um, I want to go back to that point Autumn made about working in autopsy mm -hmm. and people expecting these detailed toxicology tests to be done. And it is important to know that that doesn't always happen, right? Mm -hmm. There has to be some reason to trigger a tox test, something right. suspicious. And it's also important to realize that the standard tox test doesn't always, you know, include all the obscure poisons, right? Mm -hmm. So, I should poison you. I yeah, there's a, there's a discussion happening that we need to get plates that say that we need merch that says uh, I should poison Cord Ravenswood's plate there. There's yes. quite a bit of chatter happening over here about things we need to buy for the store, which we do. I think store. that's right. Some good poison plates. Some poison plates, yeah, yes. uh, or like maybe teacups, but it's only in the very bottom. So oh. like you drink the tea and then you're like, oh, I think yes. they exist. I think I've seen those before. <laughs> Um, Lucy, Lucy Jane Santos, she's actually going to be on our show later this year, too. She says, I know someone who wrote a book about the last meals eaten by poison victims. She cooked each one and served them to her husband while she was researching Minus the Poison. Minus the poison. <laughs> was that the, oh was a book written, uh, it was by an Australian writer about women. There was a whole outbreak of uh, women in the um, oh, Sydney oh. suburbs after World War II who mm -hmm. came up with really creative recipes to kill their husbands. <laughs> Um, largely using rat poison. And, you know, mm -hmm. I've heard discussion about some of the recipes. That's actually something that kind of interests me about poisoners. You know, what's your delivery system, which is going right. to be very different with a poison like oh. arsenic, which is tasteless versus a poison like cyanide, which is bitter, right? Right. Sharon Roney says, your death. Your death. Your death. Right. <laughs> I'm sure they would love that. <laughs> um. Let's see. We got to come over. Uh, Anthro Girl says uh, the visitation by God or drinking cold water um, as a toss up for uh, for additional causes of death. I do love um, reading. If you haven't gone back to read old headlines, I mean, today's headlines are all sort of clickbait. But prior to clickbait, there was killed by God or cold water. I mean, yes. you know, it sold the newspapers. <laughs> I mean, I love old headlines, and then they would have subheads, but, and even not just with deliberate poisoning, but in the days that uh, milk was not pasteurized and milk products were really dangerous, there's so many interesting headlines about evil ice cream, right? Because yeah, yeah, people bad. Would eat ice cream and they would die of what was then called tomains, or it's now called food poisoning. Um, right. And all the headlines are about, you know, family oh, felled oh. by ice cream, right? Felled by ice cream. Yes. You know, and, well, or, or mercury or, I mean, the, the number of things that Leanne talking about, we used to play with little balls of mercury. Mm -hmm. I worked in a museum where we absolutely did oh. not pick up mercury after it broke from thermometers with scotch tape instead of calling oh. the hazmat oh. people. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we did not do that. Although picking up those balls of mercury is not all that dangerous, right? Oh, no, no, no. That's oh, no. elemental mercury. And if you actually look at it, it will skitter along those ridges in the skin, mm -hmm. but it, you don't really absorb oh. it as much as salts of mercury, right? right? By chloride of mercury or dimethyl mercury, I mean, which are really awful mercuries, right? Oh. Um, and rough one rats. Rough one rats, so a ridiculous poison yeah. name. Right. Um, yeah, but Susan says she laughed every time. <laughs> it's my favorite rat poison name, right? The other one's oh, all pale oh. besides rough on rats. So, you know, it's 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 just you know, in the museum world though, there are, there are these protocols, and so when you break the thermometer, what you're supposed to do is call the appropriate people, and they come in in paper suits, and stuff happens, and you can't enter the area, or you pick it up with scotch tape and don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> This is not great. what you're supposed to do, but it, it is interesting. Like the things we think are dangerous versus the things that aren't dangerous. I mean, I was, I was in a building. I looked behind one of the panels one day to see the wiring and thought, this is how we're going to die. Like it's not, it's not <laughs> the perfect, that right there. That's, that's going to kill us. But um, I completely get that. I mean, I live in a really old, Oh, is my dog bothering you? I can go uh, kick him out. So to speak. If Does he want to be on camera? Can, can we, uh, we like Bongo, do you want to come in? 
He wants to just stare at me reproachfully. He wants to stare at you, yes, yes, yeah. Bart yeah, does let that. me know because I can just, you know, jump out for a minute and, and move him <laughs> if you need me to. Um, oh, we've got some other. Mike Breen says, uh, in eighth grade science class, we shaped mini hockey sticks out of sheets oh. of lead and used them to bat balls of mercury around on the table. <laughs> there was a substitute. That sounds today. like fun, right? It Did you ever do the thing with the old mercury thermometers where you would hold it close to a light bulb to try to persuade your mom you had a fever? So <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that. Bong Wee, come on, come on, come on, baby. People are interested in the week. I dog. know, he's so cute. All dogs are good dogs. Dog tax. <laughs> <laughs> he is a great dog. He's uh, 14 years old, so he's a little bit oh, of a baby. He's, right he's, a, he's a, um, he's a, yeah, my cat is 15 years old, but he's, he's, um, he's not here at the moment. He was having a, a bit of a, bit of a crisis oh, earlier oh. today. So he's okay now though. There's still a chicken in my basement though. Oh, I um, love the chicken. Who saw the last show. There's Rocky still in the basement. So oh. what Tom, speaking of pets, one of the things that I, and my, so my dad was an entomologist and he was a big venom mm -hmm. scientist. That was oh. his specialty. What? Wait, okay, Deborah, I'm sorry. Your dad was a venom scientist and you wrote the poisoner. See, it all makes sense. It now. all comes together, right? <laughs> but when I was uh, a, a, in college at the University of Georgia, which is where I got my undergrad, uh, in, which is where he was an entomologist, um, I got an apartment with three other journalism students and he brought us a tarantula as a housewarming present wow. because they wow. had this big collection of tarantulas. They were milking their fangs to study the victim, the venom. And so he brought me a tarantula in a plexiglass container uh, that I named Sasha because I was studying Russian at the time. And uh, yes, and actually she was great, right? I mean, you could pick her up and she'd run around and never do anything. But uh, the only problem I had was that I had to go down to the entomology department every week to get her a cricket. Ah. And they in the insect breeding room, they had this giant box of crickets, and you had to go head first into the cricket box. And I would come out with crickets in my hair and down my shirt. And so I developed a deep hatred of crickets. <laughs> right. I kind of understand. Yes. I just feel <laughs> mealy worms to the, the sick chicken in my, those of you who were here last time know that a hawk attacked my chicken and my chicken's living in the basement and getting fed mealy worms. And like Mark and I get up early in the morning to dice vegetables for her. I, I don't know. It's the life of a chicken, but I'm watching the time and I don't want to miss this because of course we still have a quiz. We still have a lot of things going on, but before that we have a special, something very special for you, for all of you. We went back in time to find Davy's ancestor who played the saxophone. Yes. In the time period in which we are talking. And I, I'm, I'm, we're, we're going to bring that, that historical footage to life right now. Welcome. This song is called The Poisoner's Confession Blue. my landlady with chloroform. I didn't see why I had to pay for the whole building. Should have just been the land. Poison my wife because she found out about my girlfriend girlfriend because she found out about my wife. But don't worry. I'm seeing someone new. Got very lonely. Poison my college professor with arsenic. He was a linguist. The only thing he couldn't pronounce was his own death.
poison the city toxicologist with mercury. My crimes are really starting to come back. he was trying to poison me. It was a whiskey decision, but I couldn't bear the sight of him. I approached him gingerly, slipped him something tonic, left him laying over the rocks. was great so we're a multi-talented group here um <clears throat> this is why davy has to come on camera because he's wasted behind the camera even though he's good at it could you tell <laughs> i hadn't i hadn't played improvised jazz since maybe the ninth grade jazz band <laughs> I still that was it. fantastic that was fantastic um while you right before we broke i did i did hear um a couple of some people were talking about that they completely feel your pain about the tarantula and the crickets and that it was oh. not not something oh, they were about. They're with you. They're with you. But then Thank Autumn you. Autumn says, I was shocked when a mild-mannered coworker casually mentioned how people will cover shrapnel and rat poison so the wound it causes keeps bleeding. Ew. A bit more careful around him now. <laughs> That's got to be warfarin, right? Warfarin is a blood thinner um, mm. and a really awful rat poison because, you know, if you put it out, a lot of wild animals get it too. Right. Yeah, right. Of course. I'm completely opposed to it, but that's mm -hmm. a really interesting <laughs> idea. Normal year. See? Um, yeah, it is kind of interesting when you're I'm usually that coworker though. Like to be perfectly <laughs> honest, right? I was usually the one who was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. I think, I think we all are now. Thanks to the books we've yes, all been reading. That's true. We yes, all are true. now. We have I all am. become this person. I should have worn this, but I have a 19th century poison ring. It looks like just a beautiful little ring. It's got a, uh, it's like a, a very Victorian. It's got seed pearls okay, around. Right, it, yeah. uh, Persian the, yeah, tell me. And I used to wear it to all my faculty meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking very homicidally mm. about people who wouldn't quit talking. Right. You know, I'm no longer in faculty meetings. I absconded from academe, but um, yes, I agree with you. Um, Susan Ballinger reminds us she was born this person. <laughs> Frankly, the Peculiars, we're, we're an interesting bunch. It's a big family of people exactly like this who are built for your kind of book, frankly. <laughs> this has um, been so fun already, seriously. Well, we have a little something. Everybody, everybody has to, y'all get to run the gauntlet. We've mm -hmm. got a quiz for you. We've got a quiz for you. But don't worry. You get to call upon our audience to help you if you get stuck. So we will we'll take it slow so that you guys can type your answers um, in the in the sidebar and I'll keep my eye on it. But are you ready for Davy's quiz? No. <laughs> <laughs> no so one ever I, is. I tend to look <laughs> yes. I tend to look a lot at like pop culture and movies and TV and connections and things like that. When I started looking up poison movies, I got a lot of Shakespeare. I got um, a lot of old Disney. And I was like, okay, maybe this isn't the right path. And when I looked up bootleggers and prohibition, I got a lot of Chicago. I didn't get mm -hmm. a lot of New York. Oh, interesting. So I decided that, uh, you know, after reading the book, I felt like a villainous character of the book is always the mayor of New York City. So I took the three mayors from the 1920s and we're calling this quiz... Everybody loves the mayor of New York City. So these are some fun facts about the three mayors of New York City. And uh, we'll see Peculiars help her out here. So we'll start with Mayor John F. Hyland. So in a speech from 1922, Mayor John F. Hyland famously said, and I thought this was perfect for the Peculiar Book Club, the real menace of a republic is the invisible government, which like... A giant octopus sprawls its slimy legs over our cities, states, and nation. It's a very colorful speech writer here. Or was it like a slippery snake that slithers its venomous way into our cities, banks, and lives? Or was which like a humongous elephant stomps on the chest of middle-class Americans at their homes, jobs, and saloons? 
What do you think, Deborah? What do you think he, what an analogy did he use here in his speech? See, I like the octopus. I don't know if that's right. But that's we got a lot of A's and B's here. And the answer is a giant octopus, which is why it's perfect for the Peculiar Book Club. Great imagery. Sprawls its slimy legs. Boy, government. Not. I'm so excited about that. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two. I'm going to uh, change this one. I had a hard time finding fan facts about Mayor T. Collins because Williams T. Collins, because he didn't spend a long time in office. Uh, he was only mayor for, do you think it was a month, a week, or a day? And I, Deborah, I feel like you're going to have an easier time answering this with as much research as you've done about New York City. I feel like you might have an easier time answering this than the peculiars in the chat. We're getting a lot of A's, Brandy. It looks like. Yeah, I'm doing a total blank on Mayor Collins uh, <laughs> a week. A week. She's guessing a week. And the answer was one day. He was wow. there. New Year's Eve, I think it was 1925. Uh the Highland had something about like if he left office on the 30th, he got his full pension. But if he stayed another day, it would have been in jeopardy. <laughs> so he bailed him and the sheriff bailed and they installed Williams T. Collins as mayor for one day. And that brings us to mayor number That's three, Jimmy cool. Walker. Uh, Jimmy Walker was not remembered fondly as mayor. He was forced to resign in his second term because of corruption, although he was against prohibition. He was very strongly against prohibition, which helped get him elected. But he is remembered fondly by this sport as a member of its Hall of Fame. Is he in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Boxing Hall of Fame, or the Tennis Hall of Fame? All sports, I think, have strong ties to New York City. What I the... really hope it's boxing. <laughs> what I are the... like somewhere between boxing and tennis. Boxing. <laughs> she says boxing. What do the peculiar say? Someone says he was a dynamite mayor. Nice, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was the answer. Boxing. Two yeah, he really three. got the sport of boxing, made it uh, you know, a hallmark in New York City. And uh, it's kind of one of the things he's known for. There you go. Like, like Meatloaf, who left us, said, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> Should have been worse, right? Should have been worse, I used to box, so that's why I was kind of like rooting for the boxing. Uh, um, yeah, that's I good. was the only. Uh, so I, I boxed at a place that was made Rocky Balboa's gym look good. <laughs> actually, um, like there was the roofs leaked and there were buckets everywhere if it rained, and I was the only um, assigned female at birth person in the place. So I had to box guys, but I also had to wait till everybody else changed and then go like lock the door and change myself. But yeah, so boxing. <laughs> And an octopus. You found an octopus, Davey. You found a New York octopus mare. I don't even know. <laughs> Those, don't know were how you do. Those were really <laughs> smart. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did fantastic. Yeah, I felt like the mayor, the whole political side I you, is a whole nother side of the book that just was incredible. It really was. Oh, my gosh. I know. <laughs> the, uh, like, And they were really big characters, and they were insanely corrupt, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that I'm like, I, you know, I'm thinking prohibition, uh, mafia, bootleggers. And I'm like, no, they're not even the bad guys in this story. <laughs> the bad guys are like the mayor yeah. and the political structure. And I love that. I mean, I would have hated it. At the, I don't know. It made me feel it like, you know, maybe things haven't changed all that much. Well, and you know, you don't know any mayors today who are marching down to the medical examiner's office and removing their clocks, right? I mean, not that you know of. Not that you know of. Come forward from that. Deborah, I, I did want to ask you about the, the actual cases, the actual, like, you know, the things that went to court. Were you surprised as you were researching? Were you like, well, this person's definitely guilty. Like, they've <laughs> They've clearly got the evidence, and then all of a sudden they go free because they can't. It's all circumstantial. Were you surprised by it? How many of those? No, I mean, and partly because so I my I have an unusual history, which probably also showed in this book. But when I got out of journalism school, I was a police and court reporter. Um, before I went to grad school and got my degree in science writing. And uh, so I was pretty cynical about, you know, how the system worked to begin mm. with, right? And, um, 
you, you know, whether you trust official sources or not is something you learn pretty early as a cop reporter. But also a lot of the, what I mean, I really, before mm -hmm. I wrote each story into the book, you know, thought, what does this illustrate? And, and one of the right. things I, I think is really important about Poisoner's Handbook and that I actually like about it is that it makes a case that good forensic science is just as important proving you innocent as proving you guilty, right? We tend yeah. to, in the kind of NCIS kind of way, it's always mm -hmm. about, you know, proving guilt, but really good criminal justice proves innocence too. That's and true. I, I kind of like that as one yeah. of the sort or of semi, semi innocence in the case of the guy who's like, well, I didn't kill her, but I am going to cut her up into small pieces. <laughs> Quasi innocence. line in there somewhere. I don't know. That seems a little bit, um, yeah. That guy really had problems whether he killed her or not. Finally, like, okay, this is terrible. This says so much about me as a person, but I was literally reading that and going, that's not how you cut up a person. <laughs> I mean, I know that's, but like, I, that was my, my first thought was that's not how you do that. No, he obviously had not taken good anatomy courses. No, right? no, no. And the whole thing where he likes, he, you know, he she's such a large woman, he has to cut her into pieces and then he can only carry a leg at a time. It's like a, a comedy <laughs> act, right? I kind of feel like that would be a skit we really ought to try and do at some point. Like <laughs> finger guns and lady paws dragging off body parts. Um, but, you know, it, I, I think that uh, we have a couple of people making this point that the science... I mean, in some ways, that's partly how we got to a clearer sense of things. It was yes. finally something you go, yes, but science. I mean, yes, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, Again, right, hmm, right. not always and, working. I mean, we want science. I mean, science, the actual scientific findings themselves are right political. And you, you should react to... Yeah what the evidence tells you, right, right? right? You don't want to gin up a guilty plea just because you want to notch something on your belt. If the person, right. the science shows the, and at the same time, if you're going to prove someone is guilty, then you really need to have meticulously good, well done science, right? You know, you're really making me wonder about the origin of gin up now. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm having a whole different appreciation for some of these words. Um, I have a couple announcements yes. that I want to give to everybody as we're closing up here, but there's still time for more. I know some of, there's so much going on in this book. There's It's a beautiful, wonderful read. It's a romp. If you have more questions, now's the time to type them while I am going to do a few announcements about upcoming things. And then we'll let um, Deborah answer the last of your, of your questions. So first of all, I have to get some things out of my way here. Me and my drinks. Okay, so... Tonight we have uh, a couple things to 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 discuss. One of them being that we have a cocktail name that Deborah has picked out, and Deborah chose B Bane. Yes, B Bane. That's Susan Ballinger. It's also Susan's birthday, and this is what she's going to be sent in the mail. Lovely earrings. Oh, I love those. And uh, oh yes, there. That's better. Ta -da. So um, cool. But we picked another winner as well. We usually pick a random winner, and it just so happens to be Lorelai Peterson, which I see is up here too. So uh, yes, and a happy birthday to Susan. Um, Susan says yay. We see a couple a couple of happy birthday wishes down here as well. Yay! Happy birthday. Um, and Lorelai Peterson, you also won. I saw. I I I, I know you're still on here somewhere. Um, so yes, a very peculiar happy birthday to you. So you both have won some of these. I also picked another winner. We have um, we have some, uh, they're not here yet. So they were supposed to be here. The shipping is killing me right now. But we have these really cool pins of our new Octopus logo and stuff. And we also picked one more random winner and Mike Tierney. Mike Tierney, it's you. I haven't actually seen you in the chat tonight. So hopefully you're here. If not, I'm sure you'll catch us on the flip side and I will grab your... Um, your address and send that to you. But granted, I can't send it to you yet because I don't have it yet. But I will send these in the mail as soon as possible. Other fun, um, some, oh, we've got some more happy birthday wishes. Yay! <laughs> and Lorelai says, thank you. Uh, upcoming, next time that you see us, we have some very fun things to share. First of all, 
we don't have a Valentine's Day party here, my friends. No, indeed. We have an un-Valentine's Day party, a not-Valentine's Day party. It's a wear black and eat chocolate and come up with wine cocktails and talk about murder party. And I have these for our giveaway. We've had these before. They are from a nut-free establishment. They are vegan, but they are really, really good. And I say but because I was actually rather, um, I was suspicious they wouldn't be. And I had some and then I, and then I ate them all. Um, so they're very good. But anyway, you'll be giving these away at our Valentine's Day uh, event, which is Courtney Thompson's Organ of Murder, which is about phrenology. So we're about phrenology and murder and cocktails. And it's, it's going to be a fabulous event. And in addition to that, um, on the 17th, Charming Disaster, are you guys still here? They might have had to bug out. But um, we are having a Charming Disaster concert. Yes. Peculiar Book Club presents Charming Disaster Thursday, February 17th at 7 p.m. Those who are subscribers get in free, but we are selling tickets and the proceeds will go to support the artists and you will hear music from their new about to be released album. So we're very excited about that. And you can go on our site. So those are two February events coming your way. We have, uh, of course, Scott Carney and The Wedge also coming up in February. And for those of you who are not subscribers or if you're new, if this is your first one, um, we're this wacky all the time. Uh, I wear different hats. Sometimes it's a top hat. It's usually a top hat. Um, but uh, but I really, really am hoping that you guys will check us out and come back. You can join our group. We have so many good authors coming up uh, this year, not to be missed. And frankly, they're all really awesome, just like Deborah Blum. So do I have any further questions to add? Um, Lorelei Peterson says that she was so excited uh, about the earrings that she frightened her dog. <laughs> Those earrings are so cool. <laughs> um, and yes, pins. I, as soon as I get them, they will be made available to our various... They'll be swag for events. They, they, some of them will be available online to purchase on our website. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to share. Uh, if you haven't... And actually, Davey's still waiting on his shirt because I got him the wrong size. <laughs> but these are our t-shirts. Am I holding it in the right place, Davey? It's blocking myself. Yep, you're good. Good. I'm good. You're good. And I got um, the store up here. Oh, yes. You've got the store up there as well. So um, I know that a number of you have been wearing these to work events and Zoom meetings. And I just want to tell you, you're awesome. I think that's just hilarious. Um, yes, I love it. Uh, and I want you all to join us back as soon as you can. Um, FYI, it says Rutgers Press has all 50 uh, books, 50% 50 off if you still need Organ of Murder, which is fantastic. Um, you, some of you may do. And I got one last question for you, Deborah. This comes from Leanne. She's asking us, uh, asking you if you'll tell the story you told in DC Science Writers Ari, the cement company owner who opted to take cash rather than actually meet you. Oh, that's right. That was <laughs> so funny. So when I, the whole thing was ridiculous. So I have a really good friend in Chicago who has worked at a marketing company for many years. And when Poisoner's Handbook came out, she said, we're going to do a competition. And it's going to be this great competition where we'll bring someone to Chicago and they'll get like a free stay in a hotel and they'll be able to have dinner with you and, and, you know, have this great book experience. And so they're advertising this, I'm sending this out, right. Lots of people actually entered this contest and they did this um, random drawings and they picked this guy who worked for a cement company in Ohio and whose name was Shannon DeShannon. I've always loved that name. And so my friend Denise said to him, you know, well, I want to give you the option, of, you know, taking the cash, which is about a thousand or, you know, having this amazing experience in Chicago. And he goes, I'd much rather have the money. And so I never got to have dinner with oh Mr. Shannon. But I mean, we still laugh about it. And the way she had uh, first put this forward, it was like, spend the night with Deborah Blum. And so then her sister was like, what are you suggesting, Denise? <laughs> so, obviously, he was so let down by the loss of that opportunity to decide Aww. to just take the cash. It was very fun, but it was a very fun thing to do for the book. So not my normal thing, but, you know, they were really great about doing it. That is fantastic. I honestly... I wonder if anybody would want to have dinner with me. I feel like that would be more like, maybe. It's hard to say. It's hard to totally, say. Totally, they'd be queuing up. 
I don't know. I don't know. I frightened some people. Not you guys. Not you guys. (laughs) That name sounds like he probably had a doo-wop 50s hit album or something like that. Shannon (laughs) Bell Shannon. Great name. I mean, I actually wanted to meet him and I wondered about his parents, right? (laughs) I can't come up with a name. I know. (laughs) I was named after alcohol, actually. So (laughs) yeah, people are like, oh, Brandy, you spell it with a Y. And I was like, well, it could have been cognac. <laughs> I actually have a nephew named Remy after the cognac. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, you guys would love to have dinner with me. Yeah. Well, I'd, love to have dinner. I'd love to have dinner with Deborah. Deborah, if you're ever getting back around here at some point, I know, you know, it's. I think we'd, I think we'd all love to have dinner with anybody at this point. Right? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, not so Seriously. Rude, that is but the yeah. Truth. If I'm ever out there, you're. <laughs> <laughs> your way or if you're ever here in boston let's do it you know what i would love that i actually i have to tell you several people are saying post-covid dinner party so secret secret davy and i have talked about this um we actually have locations we have there's the pinch and squeal circus training school we've talked about um which charming disaster performed at but basically um we really want to do something that involves people meeting each other but like we can't because the pandemic won't stop so um, yeah. in the meantime, we're here. We're here for all of you. You know, we're here to provide you with entertainment and on Valentine's Day parties. And it's interesting that Leanne mentions field trip. We have been thinking that possibly Davey and I should go on a field trip with a camera where it's like we're taking you with us. <laughs> um, we have this lovely cemetery uh, near us. Yeah. yeah, we have, I mean, lots of dead bodies. I mean, they're all underground, I think. <laughs> well, no, that's not true. Some of them are in a vault. They're not all underground. Cleveland, Cleveland has some nooks and crannies. Let's just say Northeast Ohio has some nooks and crannies it's where we true. can find peculiar things. We have that haunted house. We will be taking, actually, uh, if you join us for uh, Kristen O'Keefe's book, Mr. Mooter's Marvels, we will actually be at the um, the Cleveland Witchcraft Museum for that one, the Buckland Witchcraft Museum, which used to be in New York City. Oh, and cool. Yeah, and is now in Cleveland. And they're well known for having uh, uh, supposedly a demon in a box. Guess we'll see. Like um, Schrodinger's cat, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, he may or may not be in the box. It, um, you know, so that's really great. Oh, miss the cocktail. What is this for Raven, for Raven Master? Raven. Yes. Um, I yes, we I can work that out, Lexi. We can get you the cocktail for Raven Master. That one was a really fun one. It was actually uh, that was the one that was sort of a take on biscuits and blood. So, and of course, we always have the cocktail book at the end of the year for our subscribers. So, um. Anyway, I have loved having you on, Deborah. I feel like we could go on for hours. We haven't. We clearly have not heard enough from you yet. But here we are at the end of our show. So, um, any last questions or or thoughts or anything you want to throw out to our audience? Mostly, I just want to say this has been great. You know, <laughs> you have a wonderful audience. I loved the music. They are the so great. It was just like, I, I'm going to highly recommend your book club to everyone. So. It's, it is wonderful. And it's wonderful, like Andrew says, we haven't heard enough. It's true. Um, but also, it's wonderful because of the Peculiars. Um, you yes. are their great group. These they, they have kept me sane during all of these things. So um, I am so excited to have all of you on the show with us. And those of you who are new, if this is your first one, please come back. They're never, uh, they're never boring. <laughs> yes, we love seeing all the new names pop up in the chat. That's excellent. <laughs> yes, it is really nice to meet all of you new people, and I'm really excited. So come back, Deborah. Yes, Deborah, you do need to come back. Um, you can come back and be a special back. guest anytime. You are just Thank openly you. welcome to pop in. Uh, Stephanie sends Rocky best wishes. Thank you. She looks like a porcupine right now because she's growing all new feathers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all again, and I'm so glad all of you are here once again. Thank you for being here because if you're weird, you're family. You got the blue bottle blues when you wake up in the